from Kanagawa, Japan. Welcome to the GCN Show. Welcome to the GCN Show, brought to you by our friends at Wiggle. This week, we're talking about whether bikes should be banned from certain roads. Should we, in fact, ban ourselves? There is karma beside, and we're also talking about the real future of bike racing. Folding bikes. Penny farthings. Long distances. Yeah, and also two new ways to become a pro cyclist, and neither of which involve being fast. We're in. Yeah, we actually might do all right this time. This week in the world of cycling, we learned that wearing glasses when you ride is probably a good idea. This is pro cyclist Danilo Celano. Any idea what body part? Uh... Oh, yeah, his eye. Oh, it's his, his eye. eye. Thank it's his eye. eye. It does look tight though, doesn't it? My it does. goodness. Uh, this week we also learned that even bicycles have feelings. This was one of the yellow hire bikes in Bristol that Cy was so rude about this time last week. You're not much of a looker yourself, no. Cy. No, truth hurts, isn't it? Thanks, Wheels of Karma, for sending that in. Yeah, it does that. Brilliant. That looks like one of the few bikes that hasn't been thrown in the river first. So uh, that's great. Uh, we also learned this week that the world hour record is still safe. Not just Bradley Wiggins, of course, but also William A. Rose, 132-year-old penny farthing hour record. Mark Beaumont missed the record by just 250 metres. Excruciating. Uh, but he did set a new British record, so the pain and there was quite a lot of pain, I think. Uh, wasn't completely wasted. Anyway, full video on that coming up this coming Sunday, and that includes Sai's miserable attempt. Whoa. So how fast have we got to go? Is it 22 mile an hour? So you're doing about two miles an hour there. You've got to do another, uh, another, another 20. 20. Well, that'll be all right. Amazing really to think that that record has stood since the late 19th century, back okay. in the heyday of penny farthings, and at a time when you would imagine there wasn't much in the way of conflict between open road users. No, Contrary you're... to what many people have you believe now, where we are apparently uh, waging a war on a daily basis. One question which is often posed is whether cyclists should be banned from really busy, very fast roads, or perhaps any roads that are deemed dangerous, for our own good. Yeah, and should we in fact ban ourselves from potentially dangerous roads for our own sake and also to try and reduce conflict with other road users? I can hear people typing comments furiously now. Uh, we do realise this could get more tense than the G7 summit, but let's look into this a bit more before we go nuclear. We as cyclists are already banned from certain roads, so motorways here being an example, auto reeks in Europe and highways over in America. But what about removing existing permissions to ride on a road? Well, yeah, because that is exactly what was proposed in the UK here earlier in the year on the A63. Now, you can be forgiven for not knowing what the A63 is, so let me fill you in. It is a dual carriageway, so that's where there's two lanes going in each direction. And it is a busy, fast road, but bikes are allowed to go on there. However, the ban, proposed ban, has got cyclists in absolute outcry partly due to the fact that it's one of the fastest time trial courses in the country, due, in no small part, to the fact that there are cars going past you at 70 miles an hour, and that gives you quite a drafting effect. That is not a small part of your speed, is it? No, no, not at all. Uh, I think there's two issues here. There is the being allowed to ride on a road versus wanting to ride on a road, because I, for one, would choose not to ride on the A63 because it would frighten me out of my I don't know what. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd be exactly the same. Yeah. Not for me. Although I do also understand why certain cyclists would be quite worried about the prospect of a ban on this road because of the precedent it might set. Because statistically, there's going to be a whole host more roads that are more dangerous than the A63. And if cyclists are banned on those, well, it'd have devastating consequences. Well, yeah, like most cities, you'd have thought. Yeah. For me, the perception of risk, I think, comes from the speed discrepancy. So when a bike is traveling at 20 miles an hour and a car is traveling at 70 miles an hour, you can see why there is the feeling that maybe bikes aren't safe there, even if the statistics don't actually back it up. In this particular case, there were just six bike accidents in five years, where in the same period of time, there were 300 involving cars. So no empirical evidence to back it up then, just the kind of feeling that it's not safe. We shouldn't be there. Hmm. Well, from the highways agency's perspective, and they say too from the police's perspective and local authorities, there is another alternative road which is much quieter and therefore perhaps slightly safer. And you'd imagine that out of choice, 
if you knew it was there, that would be the one that you would use on your bike. Yeah, well, I certainly would, I guess. I don't like the idea of a, of a legal ban, but I do wonder whether there's some kind of educational issue here. And that I see it all the time on my local roads, cyclists putting up with really crap, busy roads, presumably because they don't know that there are other nicer alternatives to ride on. So maybe actually it's as simple as just having some signposts friendly ones, you know, like, hey, cyclist, did you know there's a nice alternative that's just 500 metres longer and actually pleasant? Well, I've got a really good example of this, actually. Yeah? Uh, many years ago, I was asked to go out riding with a junior team who was staying down in Bournemouth, which oh, is yeah. where I lived at the time. Did you, did you smash them? Like, I was about to, sign, and then this happened. Oh, no. Uh, basically, we got to a place called Ringwood, and it soon occurred to me that we were heading towards the A338. I don't know if you know it. Oh, yeah, it's one of my favourites. I love yeah. that road. Is it? Is Not it? to ride on, but no. to drive. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is a dual carriage Way on which you can drive at 70 miles per hour, so you can really get going, Si. Yeah, oh yeah. But not the sort of road that I wanted to ride on. So I went back to their team car that was following and said, are you going down a dual carriageway back to Bournemouth? And he said, yes, we've done that every year. And I said, well, there is an alternative, quieter road that runs parallel halfway. Joe goes over it and runs parallel the other side of it for the rest of the way. And he said, no, we're going to do the same as ever. So I said, well, I'm not. And I went back the other way and back into Bournemouth on the quieter road. They, I heard afterwards, were actually given a police escort eventually. I'm oh, not right. sure if they felt it was the team of cyclists that were going to be dangerous riding on the road, or the fact that the car behind them was going at 20 miles per hour, because there's no hard shoulder, uh, with other cars going past at 70. <laughs> yeah, you can see why that would get expensive for the police to give every cyclist yeah. a police escort, but probably quite nice for them actually at the time. You probably made their day riding with Dan Lloyd and then getting a police escort for the finale of their ride. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, right, now anyway, so that's, that's one question laid out of the way. What about the fact uh, of whether or not by separating bikes and cars in this instance, you're actually gonna ease tension. And I suppose the theory's pretty sound, isn't it? We cyclists like segregated bike lanes because they're nicer to ride on and they're probably safer. Statistically, I think they are. So would it not be logical then to extend that same theory up to roads where they're designed to carry cars at 70 miles an hour, for example, like motorways, and just say, well, actually, maybe it's sensible for bikes to have segregated paths and cars to be segregated on other things as well. Possibly. And you would hope it would ease tensions between cyclists yeah. and other road users, but it might not because I sort of think that if a car driver sees red every time he sees a cyclist, he gets irate, really angry, probably doesn't matter what size the road is or <laughs> yeah. even perhaps if it's a road at all. No trail rage. That's really bad with water. Oh, it's horrible, isn't it? Trail road. rage. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. It's about time that we got you lot involved because we know you're going to be ever so passionate on this subject yeah. again. Should we be banning ourselves from certain roads that we deem to be dangerous or not? Let us know in the comments below. Yeah, and let's actually, after we've commented, let end it on a positive note because it's not just bikes being banned from things. Oh no, cars in Mallorca. Yes, how do you make an incredible cycling road even more incredible? Not by banning bikes, of course, but by banning cars. Yeah, uh, you know, that's what they're saying about the A63 in, uh, in just outside Hub. Yeah, yeah, that could be stunning, couldn't it? Could I know, we're talking about Cat Formentor Tour over in Mallorca, which no doubt you'll have seen featured here on GCN in the past. A stunning road to ride on. Uh, it's a dead end, it heads out to a lighthouse where you can see a cafe and get the obligatory coffee and big cream cake at the end, <laughs> with stunning views across the sea and then back to Mallorca, it's amazing. Yeah, that's it. And if you don't fancy the bike ride out there, then you can either have a 17 kilometer walk in each direction or you just catch one of the buses that the authorities are now laying on, apparently, mm. so you can get yourself out there. And apparently, they're also considering extending this scheme uh, beyond Cap Formentor and to other climbs such as Sacalobra, Ooh. which is equally, if not more, stunning than Cap Formentor. Although, I'm willing to make a bet that if you banned cars from these roads, you might get an increase in cycling accidents with nutters trying to set the KOM down the descent. Yeah, and Sacalobra, what a descent it is, but. My words, there is, there's a penalty for getting that wrong, isn't <laughs> yeah. there? So yeah, just be careful if they do ban cars. Uh, anyway, there is another example actually in Montreal, a really, really positive example um, following the tragic death of a cyclist on their famous Montréal climb that's in the city. Uh, because actually the city then, rather than pinning the blame on cyclists, banned cars from this climb. And that's a pilot scheme apparently that launched spring of this year and is extending all the way through the summer. Wouldn't it be awful if authorities banned cars from certain roads and we cyclists ended up having so many crashes they decided it was safer to have cars <laughs> in the first place? Yeah, just take care out there. Mm. It's now time for cycling shorts.
Bromptons are an almost iconic folding bike, beloved amongst commuters, but increasingly amongst bike racers too. Uh, over the weekend, one of the most lucrative races in the UK took place called the Chapter 3 Elimination Invitational, uh, to which neither of us received an invite, surprisingly. Uh, regardless, the competitors there had to compete on the amazing Chapter 3 Brompton, uh, sorry, Chapter 3 edition Brompton bicycles. Yeah, it's got to say, I do love the Chapter 3 stuff, but those Bromptons are proper mm. nice, aren't they? Anyway, Brompton Racing, in a nutshell, Le Mans style start, where you then have to build your bike, or unfold it, not sure quite what the correct terminology is there, uh, before hitting the track, and in this case, the last rider, each lap, then gets eliminated. Now, the first place rider, the rider taking home the equivalent prize money to seventh place in the forthcoming Tour de France, which is a particularly good start, I think, uh, was Alec Briggs, who is a rider that normally races for the specialized Rocket Espresso fixed gear team. Mm. Trendy and fast, he's got it all going on, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, two things that have never been said about us, mate. No, perhaps why we didn't get an invite aside. But yeah, £10,048 for that win. Yeah, Remind not bad, eh? Start. I'm going to start training for that, as I said yesterday on the Racing News Show. <laughs> uh, right, from very modern racing to something far more traditional. So traditional, in fact, well, it's it, it's pharmaceuticals yeah. that we're getting onto. Because WADA have just released the results of a study into grey area substances, i.e. those that you are allowed to take as an athlete, but are slightly frowned upon. Yeah, so the first one is the powerful painkiller Tramadol, uh, and their study shows that it is still being used in professional cycling, which is perhaps no surprise given that it's still legal. Uh, but anyway, the interesting bit was that Tramadol shows up in 4.4% of anti-doping controls. At the same time, WADA were also tracking the use amongst athletes of glucocorticoids, and what they found was that in out-of-competition tests, 4.4% uh, of athletes were found with them. 4.4%? Yes. The same 4.4%? You reckon they're dabbling in tramadol and glucocorticoids? Well, possibly, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, well there we go. Why not? If you're going to do one thing, you might as well do it all. I do have a bit of a problem with this whole kind of grey area thing. It seems to me that if a rider behaves unethically but isn't breaking the rules, the fault really should lie with the rules not keeping pace with ethics mm. rather than the rider themselves. Doesn't I seem right. kind of I know what you're saying, but I guess it's like a really narrow road that's a national speed limit here in the UK, which is 60 miles per hour. You'd be a fool, and you'd be very dangerous to drive down it at 60 miles per hour. So I guess then the choice is up to you. Yeah, but you can't expect to be, you know, busted for speeding. Doing no. going at 55 miles an hour, no, even if you're being general. an idiot. No. Anyway, more science now. This is one I was particularly interested to say on your behalf, oh, yeah. effectively. Uh, this is the prediction of the onset of sweat during cycling. Oh. It's a shame they haven't done it on you whilst you're presenting it. <laughs> no, all right, fair enough. Uh, anyway, we saw this from Cycling Science over on Twitter, and it is actually really interesting. The research showed that exercise intensity has far more of an effect on sweating than climatic conditions. And the researchers then went on to say that e-bikes should therefore be considered the future of cycling for transport because you don't need to break into a sweat if no. you ride an e-bike. I quickly realised whilst reading this where you've been going wrong because they had the participants uh, firstly cycling at 75 watts Ooh. and then at 25 watts. <laughs> and I would imagine that you're doing more than 25 watts uh, during certain segments of the show. Presenting, you mean? Yes. Yeah, you're, pro you're probably right, actually. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, it seems that the world has gone ultra endurance crazy at the moment. We've got events all over the place. We've got the race across America, we've got the Tour Divide, we've got the race around Ireland, but there was a particularly notable ultra endurance performance right here in the UK last week as well. There was, that being the Le Jug record. That's not French, is it? It's English and yeah. Scottish. Le Jug. Uh, this is Land's End to John O'Groats, which is effectively end-to-end -end here in the UK. And that record has fallen 17 years after a certain Gethin Butler set what many saw as an unbeatable record. Yeah, Michael Broadwith, a maths teacher, overcame terrible weather, surprise, surprise, <laughs> and acute neck pain to smash the record by about 40 minutes. He covered the 840 miles in 43 hours, 25 minutes, and 13 seconds. Which is an average speed, including his stops for food and rest, of 20 miles per hour or 32 kilometers per hour, which is staggering. Isn't it just? Now, he does apparently have an FTP of 400 watts, which kind of goes some way to explaining how he can ride that fast for that long, but I suspect there must be some other kind of physiological 
freakishness about him, or maybe mental strength, I don't yeah. know. Well, you'd imagine bonkers, so. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's not normal, is it? And what I particularly like, though, was the fact that the previous record holder, who he beat, Gethin Butler, uh, actually came out to support the record attempt when he got up to Lancashire, which yeah. a nice touch. Yeah, nice touch. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do it for a no. Strava KOM, let alone a world record. No way. Nope. I'd been going there to try and put him up. I probably got one of those police stingers to try and make him puncture if he came Ah, you see, I'd, I'd tried to deal a psychological blow. Like maybe something like, yeah, I oh, done Michael, that you're looking a bit tired. Because then that, you know, that'd just be eroding away his brain for the yeah. next 12, 13 hours. Well, what I'd have done after he punctured through my sting here was throwing him a tube which was already punctured. Ooh, really nice getting one. his head. There's no way to take him my record. No way, mate. No. You'd have you'd have got him right there on the, on the roadside, wouldn't yeah. you? Because you could have just kept going, couldn't you? There's another one that's got a puncture in it as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, one place where cycling and cyclists are considered a national pride and importance is, of course, the Netherlands. And as if things weren't already pretty blooming good for cyclists over there, looks like they might be about to get even better. Uh, it's just been announced a new 100 million euro investment in cycling in the Netherlands. 74 million of that is going to be pigeonholed just for bike parking. An incredible <laughs> stat in itself, which makes you realise how many bikes they've already got there. And then the other 26 million euros, that is going to be spent on even more bicycle routes. Wow, put your hands up if you're jealous. We, we would, but obviously, uh, given that previous segment, we're kind of a bit embarrassed too. Uh, but anyway, apparently the money's been set aside to try and lure 200,000 commuters out of their cars and onto their bikes. What I really like the sound of though was a further incentive that they might be bringing in, they're talking to employers about this at the moment, whereby you could get 19 cents per kilometer if you ditch your car and instead choose to ride a bike to work. That is amazing. I would consider moving further away from work in order to spend longer on my bike and therefore get more money. I could, I could pay for a really extravagant lunch every day just from my commute. That'd be amazing. Mm -hmm. We could save it. Or I eat loads of really nice food. <laughs> Regardless, we could potentially be earning more money per kilometre doing that than we're used to as pro cyclists, couldn't we? I think almost undoubtedly I would, yeah. And we could increase our salary even further if we choose to ride this, the Toba bike, uh, because this produces cryptocurrency as you ride. Yes, now we're talking. So this is electric bike retailer 50 Cycles, and to celebrate their 15th anniversary, they have released the Toba. Okay, so if you ride for a thousand miles on this bike, it will generate 24 pounds, yeah? And it can either be redeemed for, I don't know, actual goods at certain retailers, or you cash it in for something like Bitcoin. Wow, I'm in. Yeah? Definitely. Uh, right, talking about incentivizing commuting, we shall finish cycling shorts this week with the Red Bull Million Mile Commute. Uh, last year, they smashed their target, uh, thanks to your help. So 8,300 people took part in total, uh, and 2,400 miles of those million miles was done by one person, Moon Sun Lee. Did it in a month. Wow, hang on a minute, that's like 456 euros in the Netherlands. Yeah or 48 pounds of cryptocurrency. Well, well I think you almost can't say you missed out there. Yeah. But uh, anyway, nevertheless, uh, Red Bull this time, their target is to do all those million miles in just the month of July. So if you want to take part, and I suggest you do, you can log in on Strava. There's a link to their particular page in the description beneath this video. And there's also gonna be a load of extra incentives as well. So for example, if you look on a can of Red Bull or Red Bull Sugar Free, apparently there's a way there of redeeming a month of free Strava Premium, hmm, which is quite good. cool, isn't it? It's the GCN Wiggle of Fortune now. One lucky contestant is in with a shout at winning up to 150 pounds of Wiggle vouchers. Yeah, that's a prize one, which are the four red ones here, and it goes down to prize four, which are 25 pounds of Wiggle vouchers, which you can spend on absolutely anything on their online shop. I had loads of entrants to be contestants this week. Only one contestant though, and that person is Jens oh. Kramich. Oh. Right, good luck Jens. To you, Jens. Yeah, good luck. Now, before we get going, let's also just clarify: there is one other icon on the GCM Wiggle of Fortune, the beer icon. That's right, mm. Jens. If it lands on that, you do not win anything. But Dan, I do. Dan wins a beer. Right, let's crack on with this. In three, in two, in one, and we are off. You get a bit thirsty, now, aren't you, Dan? Because it's been a while. It is. Yeah. In fact, you've never won on the Wiggle of Fortune. I've been Ooh. actually having to have mineral waters. Today. Oh, it's looking good, though. It's looking good. It's looking good, Dan. Oh! <laughs> hey! 
Yes! Now he gets a beer! Oh, got to limp Me. over to the fridge. Yes! High I don't five. believe it. How many weeks has that been? I've got a bad hip. I don't know. Oh, it's going to be all better now. He's, Dan's won a beer! Oh, Jens, I'm so sorry, but hopefully you feel oh, now it's like... It's a Belgian Ooh. beer. Is Jens Belgian, perhaps? There we go. <laughs> I'm so, I actually feel really guilty now. Sorry, well, Jens. Jens, we'll send you a GCM bottle in the post, mate. I'm sorry, but that is... God damn, have you got a bottle opener? Uh, I have. There we go. And I'm going to get a glass after this. Tech of the week now, and first of all, there is apparently some kind of football tournament going on at the moment. And if you're one of those few people that's interested in it, but you still want to keep riding your bike and know about the football results, then Kobe, which is a cycling startup, might have something for you. So they've designed an app for your phone that then you attach to your bike using their phone holder and front light contraption. And while you cycle, it will keep you updated of any goals scored or team changes or anything like that. Sounds great. Super safe, at least, Oh, yeah, super safe. Now, we've been doing quite a few videos on bike packing recently. Uh, I haven't, so I has. But I've decided that this looks a little bit more up my street, personally. It's called the Bee Turtle. <laughs> and what it is, is a bike trailer come sort of inflatable caravan, really. <laughs> uh, which means that you can sleep in some comfort overnight. Yeah, like relative comfort. Well, it's, got, it's got a storage capacity of 120 litres in that bad boy which is ample room for a nice duvet or maybe just yeah. a sleeping bag or like a fleecy onesie. Probably all three, mate, in there. I you reckon. know what, I can actually see you with an inflatable caravan being towed behind your e-bike. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, there has been some more conventional tech actually released into the cycling world over the last week, particularly notable, super cool new aluminium cyclocross come gravel bikes from Canyon and BMC. So the Canyon InFlight and the BMC Road Machine X both of which actually are running SRAM Apex one by drivetrains as well. Mm. Canyon is a bit more of a gravel bike, isn't it? And the BMC slightly more road pedigree. Really. Well, I think the Canyon Infly is probably more of a cross bike than a yeah. gravel bike. Are we going to have another argument? Well, I don't know. The BMC is more of like a road bike slash gravel bike. Well, regardless, they both look very versatile, don't they? And more importantly, they look super fun to ride to. That is the point, isn't it? Wherever they are on the spectrum, they look quite fun. It's been another really busy week in the world of professional bike racing, much of which I've tried to cover on yesterday's racing news show. Uh, but here on the GCN show, let's firstly talk about the Ovo Energy Women's Tour. There, it was great to see Corinne Vera take her first ever GC win, which I was surprised about. Not, not that she won, but that she'd never won a GC before. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, actually. And also, it was great to see Mariana Voss right back up there. She went on to finish second overall. And she didn't, or she finished outside the top three only once on yeah. all, all the stages. Yeah, and that time she finished outside the top three was the first stage, and even then she was sixth. That's Consist not bad. Consistency is it? personified, Marilyn. Yeah. But she didn't win any of the stages. No. And it did get me wondering whether she's not quite the same force that she was to be reckoned with from a few years ago, or whether the standard in women's racing is just very high compared to her <laughs> dominant era. It's an interesting one, actually, that, isn't it? It's probably a bit of both, but I suspect more the latter. I mean, it yeah. does seem particularly like the standard is just super duper high at the moment. And in fact, one rider who wasn't at the Ovo Energy Women's Tour was Anna van der Breggen. Uh, and she won't even be going on to defend her Giro Rosa crown either because she's going to take part in a World Cup cross country mountain bike race at Val de Sol in Italy. That's right. Apparently, she's got bored of winning big races on the road. <laughs> oh, enviable what? position to yeah. be in. Uh, she's chosen that particular round of the mountain bike World Cup because apparently it's the least technical of all the cross country courses. But nevertheless, uh, it'll be very interesting to see how she gets on there. Uh, along with the Over Energy Women's Tour, there's also been a whole host of warm-up races for the Tour de France. Still big races in their own right. Uh, the Route d'Occitanie, which used to be the Route du Sud. Uh, we also had the Tour of Slovenia and, of course, the Tour de Suisse. They were won by Valverde, Roglic and Richie Port, respectively. Giveaway time now. No new ones for you this week, unfortunately, but some big results to read out now because this was the Continental competition. Uh, three prizes here. The first winner we are going to read out is of the Continental Le Cadet. Uh, this was for a rider, a young rider, to be able to ride the first and last part of the first stage of the Tour de France. Doesn't get much bigger than that if you're a young rider or oh, even yeah. if you're an old rider like us. Yeah. But we weren't allowed to enter. No. Partly because of age, partly because of where we work. Nevertheless, the winner of this competition is... 
Matthew Brooker. So, well done to you, Matthew. Yeah, congratulations. Huge congratulations. Yeah. Oh, I'm dead jealous. I am as well. Yeah, I think that would have been a great prize for absolutely anybody of that age. Uh, next up, the Continental Tour de France VIP package goes to Sebastian Kramer of Germany and the VVIP package, also from Continental, uh, goes to Chris Martin over in the USA. So very well done to all of you. We very much hope you all enjoy your experiences. I'm yeah, sure you will. Got to do a quick shout out actually over on the tech channel. We have a pretty stupendous unboxing. Uh, or rather the prize is stupendous, I'm not commenting on the quality of the video. But anyway, we're giving away a huge package from Oakley, including helmet, glasses, and shorts and a jersey. It's pretty cool. Mighty fine and stupendous is. <laughs> <laughs> it's time now for hack forward slash bodge of the week. We're gonna start with something that's potentially amazing. So amazing, I can't actually work out whether it's a fake or not, right? So uh, have a look at this one then, Dan. So this is from uh, Joshua Pullman on Twitter. And it effectively, I think he's built himself a Wahoo kicker climb, okay? So, so that is uh, a thing for your indoor trainer and you attach the front of the bike to, and depending on what gradient you're going up in Zwift or something, it will tip your bike to that angle. Okay, and it, he reckons he's got that automatically on there. Uh, he's also got a fan that looks like it changes intensity depending on how fast you're riding. And then there's also a dragon on there as well, mm. which, which is quite remarkable. So potentially, that's an amazing bit of kit. Well, it does look in the main photo as though he's going down a 45% gradient. Uh, uh, minus 18, I think he said, is the is steepest it, no, descent. It's going to be more than that, surely. No, you're descending off a cliff there. <laughs> uh, well, if that is not hashtag fake news, then that is definitely a hack. Otherwise, uh, if he's pulled the wool over our eyes, which he might well have done, bodge. Yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Potentially the greatest hack of all time, but probably yeah. a bodge. We need video, not photos. Come on. Yes, please. Next yeah. time, next week, we might be show showcasing it. Uh, next up, this from Shotten Zainin. Love this. <laughs> the cycle booty fan. Whoa! Refreshing your nether regions while waiting for traffic lights, etc. So he's got sort of a, an aerated saddle, which doesn't <laughs> look particularly comfortable, and then one of those really cheap fans underneath. Well, that's remarkable. I mean, you, you need quite a powerful fan to get through your average kind of luxury chamois, wouldn't you? Yes. But, uh, but still, yeah, any, eh, any little extra ventilation is probably going to help, isn't it? I just get out of the saddle. Speed, I'm going. <laughs> Wind's bristling through there. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on, <laughs> this one, you know what Dan, I'm going to say before we oh. look at this is a proper hack, this is sent in by Diono on Twitter, is this cheap enough? His homemade chain keeper, and you know what, I'm going to say yes that is, that is an absolutely ingenious hack, the first chain keeper I'm ever going to endorse. Mm, yeah, I just snuck that back in because I actually took it out before we started recording, <laughs> he was surprised when he saw that there weren't you? Oh I was, yeah. yeah. Uh, next chain up, keepers. from Dominic Schlupag. Just huge apologies for that. Oh, I saw sure this today. <laughs> we don't know whether it can be considered as a hack or a bodge. That is a that is a mighty big chain ring there, isn't it? But well, maybe you need it with those size wheels. I think that's a hack. Is that a folding bike? Well, I'm going to say quite... bodge. Oh really? Yes. Oh. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, coming up, he's got this from uh, Lena Yeager, uh, and she has said, this is how you fix a bib short with a tube patch. Use two of them and glue them together. Oh my word. Wow. I never even thought about that, but yeah, a gluing fabric is like a thing, isn't it? Yeah, so, inside. Uh, I don't know whether it would work with it. I thought like inner tube glue like works by like sort of melting the rubber, like vulcanize it, don't they? So anyway. Clearly it has worked, so uh, it's inspired. Yeah, I have no answer to your vulcanizing rubber thing. I've got no idea, I'm afraid, as with many things. Yeah, I, just, uh, I don't even know what I'm talking about. But regardless, I uh, love watching or uh, seeing your hacks and bodges. If you would like to get involved in this, it's very easy indeed. Uh, all you need to do is use the hashtag GCN hack, shove it up on Twitter or send it to us as a message on Facebook. And if we like it, or if we really don't like it, it'll probably be included in next week's show. Yeah, and remember as well that if it's such an amazing amazing hack that we're actually going to be slightly skeptical of whether it exists or not, a video yeah. will seal the deal. Proof. Yeah, because you can't ever fake video, can you? It's time now for caption competition. Already forgot to get a bottle out. Oh, the winner of the caption competition gets a GCN Camelback water bottle. There we go, there is this week's shining example of one. Mm. Uh, this is the photo that we gave you last week and we asked you to caption. Dan, have we got a winner? We have, and the winner is Benedict IEP. 
and put caption. I really like these new Pordian girls. Poor Diem. Yeah. Good. Well, yeah, like, quite a lot of poor yeah. captions. But we chose that one as our favourite. So <laughs> I like what you did there. Quite a lot of poor captions. <laughs> Didn't even know what I did there, but yeah, I'll take that. Uh, get in touch with us, Benedict, on Facebook <laughs> with a message of your address, and we should get that out to you. Uh, what have we got this week? Ooh, that looks like a likely looking photo. Uh, Dan, can you hit us with a poor caption? Uh, Stefan Kung. How about. Oh no, not the King Daily Mail. I think a large chunk of our audience might need some kind of explanation there uh, for that particular caption. Uh, Stefan Kung and also the Daily Mail, which is a uh, uh, slightly controversial newspaper here in the UK. Yes. But otherwise, that's a wicked caption. Right? <laughs> yeah, with those caveats, it was brilliant. Uh, get involved in the comments below with your captions, and as we said, we'll pick our favourite this time next week. This is the point in the show where we normally read out some of our favourite comments. Uh, this week, we're reading out the following comments. Not necessarily <laughs> our favourite. Uh, we had a lot of reaction to Chris Open, James uh, Losley Williams joining as presenters last week. All right, guys, did you bring the Harry, Ben? Well, we did, actually. Yes. Nice. Good work. Uh, including this, after I introduced them on Twitter, uh, Ben Ward wrote back and said, these chaps look like Love Island contestants. Uh, that's meant to be a compliment. Uh, Love Island, uh, for those of you over in the US or not in the UK, basically, full of big hunks. And, uh, <laughs> and their female equivalent. <laughs> Stupendous hunks. <laughs> and then I said, what, and cyanide don't look like we could be Love Island contestants. And he wrote oh, yeah, back to Ben Ward and said, maybe the undateables <laughs> is more suited to you guys. So thanks for that, Ben. Uh, George Hugh, look at the guns on Chris and James. <laughs> Not sure which is which, but no matter, uh, jars can finally be opened and moderately heavy ob objects lifted around that, GCN. That is a very good point, that, isn't it? I mean, they, they made light work of your suitcase the other day. So, oh, they did. Uh, that yeah. was brilliant, particularly good to see. Uh, then underneath, how to climb comfortably. I like this from BCA, uh, Bietekland Chu Al Axel. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, forget comfort, how do you stay alive when you're climbing? Good point. I think that's what a lot of people are looking for, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe that's one for us to do. <laughs> How do you stay alive when you're trying to climb up a mountain? Uh, right then, on the channel this coming week, uh, we've got some more climbing tips from Emma actually on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, Wednesday is how to climb out of the saddle, and then on Thursday, she's going to show you uh, climbing hacks for KOM glory, which uh, we all want, or QOM as the case may be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Friday, we think we've got a special Ask Geese Anything with none other than Mariana Voss. Do you think Emma asked her whether the standard? <laughs> Not as, she's not as good anymore. <laughs> I'm sure that was probably her first question. Yeah, yeah there we go. Is the standard high or are you just not as good as it used to be? <laughs> <laughs> Set the tone for a really great ask, that one. Uh, right, on Saturday, we've got the latest in Emma's Oat Cuisine series. So these are lemon blueberry pancakes, which sound absolutely delicious. Then on uh, Sunday, sorry, I forgot what days of the week we're on, uh, we go behind the scenes at Mark Beaumont's penny farthing record attempt. So uh, make sure you check that one out. It's uh, a little bit out of the ordinary for us, but uh, blooming good fun to make that one. So hopefully it's good fun to watch. And then of course, Monday and Tuesday, there are regulars. Monday is the GCN Racing News show and Tuesday is the GCN show. Time now for Extreme Corner and aside from crashing this is probably the most suffering we've ever had on Extreme Corner. Oh man, <laughs> I can't stop. Oh my God. It's interesting, isn't it? I thought I was going to be sick then when I got to the top. Ooh. That's a lot of suffering right that there. That is a lot it? of pain, isn't it? I reckon Lasty would struggle to get that amount of, actually no, of course Lasty's the king of suffering. Well, I think it's different. I think if you're an anaerobic monster like that, you can go so deep, can't you, in a way that we can't. <laughs> and you yeah. just must feel incredibly sick after an effort like that. Yeah, anyway, right. there we go. That was Ollie Wilkins, uh, who was filming a video recently for EMBN, so our electric mountain bike channel. That was well worth checking out if you haven't. Um, yes, pretty incredible, those e-bikes, aren't they? Yes, 
Yeah, my cup of tea, those things. <laughs> yeah. All right, it's almost the end of the show this week. Uh, we would like to give a quick plug to the GCN shop, g uh, shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. You should find a link to that very shortly on screen. Uh, if you don't get lucky enough to win the caption competition, uh, things such as the GCN Camelback water bottle are available there, as are our replica kits and our fan kits. And those black ones that we showed you last week are yeah. selling out pretty fast. Yeah, they are indeed. Remember, there is a 10% discount if you buy the shorts and the jersey as well. And you might as well, because they look pretty cool together. I think. Yeah. Right then, if you want to watch another video, now you've got to the end of this one, and uh, I suggest, if you haven't seen it already, you really want to watch this. This is Emma's proper science. Uh, anyway, there yeah. we go. Find out the ultimate upgrade you can make to your bike if you want to go faster. We're about to watch it and make notes. <laughs>